Welcome to this quick tutorial video on Bergmuller's fantastic Tarantella in D minor. Now this video is not going to be focusing so much on how to play the right notes, uh, correct fingering, rhythm, stuff like that. Rather it's going to be more geared towards some polishing details and some physical techniques that will hopefully help you navigate some of the technical challenges in this piece. Um, now, if you are not at the point in your study of this work where you feel really confident with playing the right notes, with the right fingering, steady tempo, etc., not to worry. Stay with us and hopefully you'll pick up some pointers and some things to think about as you move forward in your practice of this piece. Let's get down to business. This opening has consistently proven to be somewhat treacherous and deceptively difficult. Uh, and the reason for that can be traced back to those nasty, nasty repeated notes that we all hate to play. Um, it, it's really hard to get around those with a really nice inflection, keep everything really even, and not let any sort of like overly staccato notes or unintended accents sort of rear their ugly heads. So oftentimes what I'll hear when people first bring this piece to me is something uh, that sounds like a hiccup almost. I tend to hear... Which is because they're oftentimes being very diligent about those groups of three eighth notes, the slurs there. But we want to avoid hiccups in music, uh, as in life generally speaking. So there are a couple physical reasons that it's quite difficult to play repeated notes on the piano. And they can generally be traced back to two things. Number one of which is your wrist position, arguably the most important uh, aspect in playing a repeated note. And also where exactly your finger tries to encounter the, uh, the repeated note, the second repeated note, on its journey back to, uh, I don't know, its full height, I guess we could say. So what am I talking about? Oftentimes, when um, I find that students are having a challenge in getting the, uh, this opening repeated note gesture to articulate, it's oftentimes because their wrist is a little too low. I think you can see here. Generally speaking, and of course there are always exceptions to every rule in music, but generally speaking, an ideal wrist position will be pretty much straight across, if you can see, from the back of my hand to the top of my forearm. That's a really nice default place for your wrist to be. You want to avoid stuff like this, you want to avoid stuff like that, for a number of reasons. If you're down here, the weight of your arm is not actually going into the keys, it's not being used effectively, it's down below them. Uh, also, it can really damage your wrist. If you try this, you can really feel that it's pulling on these tendons. It's just not great. It's really hard to get this to move really evenly. Less than ideal, try to avoid this. Now, uh, this conversely, but similarly, 
the weight of your arm is not being used effectively in the keys. It's out of the keys, yeah? So you want to make sure that this is straight so this can all be really used very effectively and efficiently. Now, I'm about to say a slight exception to this rule. When I am playing repeated notes, I find it quite helpful to adjust this wrist position upwards a bit by like say two millimeters, yeah? If I come up just that little bit, somehow that really enables me to get the notes to repeat a lot more easily than if I'm here just in my natural. Oh, it's awkward, it doesn't feel great. So just when you're playing any repeated notes, and in particular when you're on the black keys, if you think about adjusting your wrist upwards just a tiny, tiny amount, all of a sudden everything comes into a bit sharper focus and uh, it becomes a lot easier. Same, same tip applies when you're playing uh, ornaments and Baroque music. Yeah, it just makes it a little bit easier to navigate. A second ago, I said there were two things that uh, come into play on these repeated notes in the opening. So we've covered number one, the wrist. The second thing, where is that finger re-encountering the note? Um, so what I mean by that is obviously I play this first one. The F has to come back up to be replayed somewhat obviously um, and oftentimes when you find that you're not able to get the repetition that you desire it's because your finger is blocking the note from coming all the way up yeah so what you want to think about is the note that's going to play or the finger excuse me that's going to play the second of the repeated notes is going to be just exactly at the key surface where that key will come up. So I'm going to meet that key right when it reaches its apex. My finger will be there right ready to, to play it. They're just going to kiss right there and then come right back down. I'm going to try to avoid my finger being too low in the key bed. Otherwise, it's going to be quite difficult to get that note to repeat really nicely. Now we've successfully survived the opening first few measures. Our repeated notes are sounding great. Got some nice crescendos, decrescendo hairpin dynamics through here. It sounds beautiful. Uh, let's talk about the next couple measures here, measures six, seven, and eight. Oftentimes when people are first working on this piece, uh, somehow they can't resist the temptation to just forget about those rests that Bergmuller wrote there. I'll oftentimes hear these really dramatically played and super well sustained chords. It's worth noting he wrote a quarter note with an eighth rest and then a uh, quarter rest and then another eighth rest. So he wanted some silence here. Um, so resist the temptation to over sustain. I tend to hear. <laughs> Yeah, you want to avoid that. So I think that it's really important on these chords to pay really, really careful attention to the releases of them. As pianists, I'm always talking about it with my students. As pianists, it's really, really easy for us to fall into the trap of paying attention to only the articulation of the beginnings of our chords or a note in a melody even, uh, and neglect listening all the way through to the end and release of those notes. That's where we really get our beautiful cantabiles uh, and energetic sort of exciting releases of things is paying attention to the ends of the notes. So in this place, I find it really helpful to think that each of these chords is crescendoing. We can't physically do it on the piano, but you can imagine a violinist using their bow and going, Duh. they get that little extra zip at the end of a, a really exciting piece with their bow, and it gives just that much more excitement to the chord. We can think that as we play the piano, and it will somehow influence our release, which influences the sound, which influences the excitement that the audience feels. So rather than playing just boring, boo, get off the stage, um, listen to the release and you'll have that standing ovation before you even get to measure nine, yeah? So, so much more uh, exciting, yeah? just by listening to the releases. Now, uh, the very last chord here in measure uh, eight, that one, 
is the one that really entices everybody to overhold it. It's something about that one chord. People just get addicted to holding it for 700 years, make sure it's precisely one quarter. It's worth noting that Bergmuller does have a fermata in that measure, but it's over a rest, not over the chord. So try to avoid that pitfall of staying in that note for forever. I know it feels great, but don't do it. We all spend so much time on this piece focusing on our right hand, in particular the repeated notes we were talking about a second ago, uh, that it's really easy to overlook what's happening with our left hand. And that poor left hand just gets neglected. I oftentimes will hear that people are so focused on playing a beautiful melodic line with the right hand that they don't observe the correct rhythm on the left hand. It's worth noting that oftentimes throughout this piece he has the left hand written as a full value dotted quarter note. Oftentimes I'll hear things like this. Yeah? You want to make sure that you're sustaining those for their full value. It just has a very special texture that sort of gives us this nice, beautiful sonority that I think is really special. Um, so if you want to get really OCD and do a deep dive on piano technique, now's your chance. Uh, there's this thing that a lot of pianists use, well, all pianists use, uh, calling, called finger pedaling. And it's not easy, but I think it's really vital. And this is a really good opportunity to explore that a bit. So what am I talking about with finger pedaling? Um, when you finger pedal, you're really staying in those keys for as long as you possibly can, and actually a bit longer than you possibly can. And um, it gives the illusion of the pedal sustaining things without actually having to use it. How does this work? On a grand piano, we have our strings. We have the dampers that when you're not using the pedal or pressing the key down, just rest on the strings and keep them from vibrating, right? Now, when you use the pedal, the damper pedal, those dampers come up and allow the strings to vibrate. When you uh, play a key, those dampers come up and allow the string to vibrate. When you let that key up or your foot up on the pedal, boom, those dampers come down, stop the string, stop the sound. Now, when we are playing a nice piano, hopefully you have access to one, uh, you can play with the depth of the key and not allow the key to come all the way back up, which doesn't allow the dampers to come down and close on the strings, which would stop the sound, obviously. So you can let the key sustain the note, yeah? And I think that this left hand place is a really good opportunity to practice it. So I'm staying in that key and not allowing it to become silent. Yeah, so I think that it's a really um, uh, mind-bending thing to practice, but it's a really good exercise, and it's a challenge. But it has a couple of benefits besides those uh, those notes having that nice sonority of the finger pedal. It also will ensure that uh, you're avoiding letting those chords be too short, which is a pitfall that, as I said, a ton of people fall into. Don't let this be you. When we're playing a piece with multiple repeats, it really gives us an opportunity to get really creative and show what we can do with the same material by changing somehow the inflection of it, the color, some dynamics, maybe a bit of timing, all those kind of things. Use your musical creativity um, to really explore ways of making the same line sound completely different. Uh, so you probably noticed in my performance that in measure 23, measure 24, somewhere in there, when I had the repeat, I it took some liberties with the time. I don't think that it's necessarily um, uh, super egregious in that place. I just can't resist stretching that and putting significant uh, retard. I kind of like it. Other people's tastes may vary, but I wouldn't recommend doing that in Mozart or Beethoven. But I think with Bergmuller, Romantic Period, we can get away with 
uh, some liberties in terms of the timing. So the first time, you know, at measure 23, I like to keep it kind of straight ahead. And then just keep going on, right? But the second time through, like I said, I can't resist stretching that sucker out and being just almost Liberace-esque, you know, take it over the top. You know, obviously that was probably a, li a little bit too crazy, but like I was saying, use your creativity to just mix it up a little bit so that the audience, again, is on the edge of their seats and excited to hear what the next little innovation you're going to do is on the repeat. We have now arrived at the middle passage of this piece and what could be more different than what came before. We are at measure 33. All of a sudden, we are in D major as opposed to the D minor that we had before. So a ray of sunshine has entered our super creepy scherzando-ish world. Uh, everything is very dry sounding all of a sudden. We don't have any slurs in sight for at least a few measures. Everything is marked with a carrot, that uh, accenty staccato kind of thing. Um, and all of a sudden, it's got this just uh, almost like carefree Italian tenor on a gondola kind of feel to it in certain places that I think it's really nice to bring out. It's such a contrast to, to the surrounding material. Um, now, a couple things to be careful of that I hear people sort of uh, fall prey to sometimes when they're playing this. Um, whereas before, I was saying that the left hand oftentimes is too short. Uh, back at wherever that was, measure 9, 10, through all that stuff, and you need to make sure that you have a full value sustained of those. This place, oftentimes people take that suggestion too much to heart. So always be paying attention to the context of what we're talking about. In this place, oftentimes I'll hear that the left hand is too long and doesn't match what you're doing with the right hand. So I'll hear something like... Something like that. You want to make sure that they are precisely releasing at the same time. Yeah? So just look out for that. And uh, I think it has so much more of a nice effect. Now, the exception to that is when we get to measure 36. Um, all of a sudden, he has that really singable cantabile right hand slur. And in addition to the two note slur convention that we were talking about before with the strong, weak inflection, Bergmuller has really doubled down on wanting that first F sharp to be really, really uh, impactful. He's put a sforzando on it in addition to just the, the two note slur. So he really wants that note to really stand out as, as an important moment in this passage. So we have a. Yeah, a really, really uh, uh, pronounced attention to that F sharp that he wants there. Um, now, another word of caution on this particular measure. Uh, same thing that I was saying earlier, um, where you want to make sure that the articulations don't necessarily impact each other. So a lot of times people will see, oh, the right hand is playing legato, and somehow, somewhat inadvertently, the left hand will sort of match and uh, it'll become more lengthy, almost legato. You want to avoid that in this place. So you want to keep the consistency of the staccato left hands throughout this entire passage. Um, so the fact that the right hand is playing really staccato, uh, excuse me, really legato, is something that we want to keep separate from the left hand. So I've got, if I start at measure 35, this is all matching and then, I still keep my left hand really nice and short while I play legato on the right hand. Very important. Okay, now we get to another moment in this piece that is such a challenge, and it's these repeated notes. Those things, everybody's least favorite part of this piece. Um, it, don't be scared. If you just practice really carefully with the same concepts we were talking about in the very first couple measures of this piece, those repeated notes shouldn't pose too much of a problem. Obviously, it'll take a lot of work to get them down, but you know, playing an instrument really well takes a lot of work. So just keep paying attention to the position of your wrist. Again, bring it up. 
just a tiny bit higher than you normally would and you'll be shocked and amazed and excited hopefully at how well those repeated notes sound um, so something else to think about this is the switching of the fingers yeah so we've got that three two hopefully you can see here i'm adjusting my wrist up a little bit yeah Again, the same thing that I was talking about with thinking about the um, note that's going to, the finger that's going to play the second note being right at the apex of where that key comes up, just ready to meet it and let it go back down. Yeah. So just be aware of those couple things and you won't have any problem getting those to articulate. We have made it to the end of our piece. We have successfully navigated all these pitfalls and technical challenges that have stood in our way um, to getting to these last couple lines successfully. Yay us, this is awesome. The last couple lines here where we're ascending the spider's web, right, uh, is not really going to pose any new concepts to us, yeah? Uh, all those same things that we've been talking about with the uh, slightly adjusted wrist position for repeated notes, making sure your fingers are in the right place to meet the keys as they repeat, um, singing cantabile, sustaining the left hand for its full notated value. All of those things are in play on these last couple, uh, couple lines. There is one thing that we haven't yet talked about uh, that he throws at us in the last uh, few measures, last five measures or so. And that is the diminuendo and poco ritenuto, right? So ritenuto, remember, means that we're slowing down. Same thing as a retard, rallentando. Poco means a little bit. Diminuendo, I'm sure you know, means that we're getting quieter. So he wants us in this place to get quieter and slow down a little bit. Uh, something that I'll hear oftentimes when people are playing this piece is that the ritenuto isn't maybe the most evenly paced out thing. It sounds a little bit... Uh, like we're slamming on the brakes instead of just letting your foot off the gas and gradually coasting to a slower tempo rather than very, oh, I'm slow all of a sudden. Yeah, it's what you want to avoid. So how do we go about achieving a really, really well-paced retard and make sure that it's really organic feeling and very natural? Uh, number one way to do it, subdivide those rhythms mentally. So what do I mean by that? Uh, all that subdividing is, is taking the notated rhythm, in this case it's eighth notes, and taking it down into a smaller rhythmic increment. So I might start thinking in sixteenth notes in this place. So it would be obviously two sixteenths for every eighth note. And what that does is it gives you a bit more precision in pacing your retard out. So rather than just kind of like guessing that I'm playing it correctly, by listening to my eighth notes, um, I can really, really, really dial it in and just make absolutely certain that it, everything is really proportional. So I'm going to think uh, in sixteenth. So it'll in a very slow tempo because I can't sing very fast. It'll be ba da 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 yeah and having that extra 16th note on each of those notes just like i said gives you a little bit more accuracy and you can hear it slowing down uh, much more easily so subdividing absolutely crucial um, technique that we use to make sure things uh, retard really smoothly now one final detail we've succeeded with our beautifully paced ritenuto on these last few measures if you look at the next to last measure here he has all of a sudden written a tempo back into the initial tempo. So we have this very dramatic stretching. Oh, it's very languid. Okay, we are very relaxed now. And then bam, bam, bam. All of a sudden it's just crashing excitement, uh, huge bombastic chords. <laughs> back in that tempo. Really lull your audience into a state of blissful relaxation and bam, smack them in the face, wake them up for the end of your performance with that ah tempo fortissimo set of chords. Well, we've made it through Bergmuller's Tarantella. Thanks for watching. I hope that uh, you've gotten some helpful tips out of this. If you're interested in some one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, I'd love to hear you. 
just click on the description and there should be a link to my website, which I'm easily contacted through. Uh, thanks again for watching and until next time, happy practicing.